Hi, my name is Charles Landelius. I'm an accountant with Berkeley Research Group, and my one big thing for the Securities Enforcement Forum West 2020 is remember to ask for the audit work papers. Auditors perform a wide range of review of internal control in the course of performing their audits, and it could very well be that if your client is facing an enforcement action or an investor lawsuit, the auditors may have covered and reviewed and tested controls in the area that's the subject of that particular action. So, remember to ask for the work papers and you can see what the auditors tested and what conclusions they reached and maybe you can determine whether controls were operating effectively. And that's my one big thing for the enforcement forum. Enjoy the conference. All right, welcome back. Our next panel focuses on the heart and soul of SEC regulation, asset managers, broker dealers, hedge funds, and other similar regulated entities. It's a hornet's nest of SEC regulation where any kind of regulatory infraction can lead to any kind of consequence. Uh, I'm very pleased to have Lori Echevarria as our moderator. She is a former SEC enforcement staffer of 15 years. Uh, she was our associate regional director and head of the enforcement program for the LA regional office. Lori was also an assistant director at the SEC for more than five years and served in the municipal securities and public pension specialized unit for more than two years. And she's now a partner uh, at Wilmer Hale, where she represents public companies, corporate officers, financial institution, hedge funds, and other uh, financial market participants who face government investigations and enforcement actions. Lori, uh, welcome. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, next up, Charles Andelius, Managing Director of the Berkeley Research Group's Capital Markets Group. Uh, Charles works as an expert witness specializing in regulation of and securities trading by broker dealers, futures commission merchants, investment advisors, hedge funds, insurance companies, and banks, and he's been an expert witness in over 50 cases, covering just about every aspect of securities regulation. Uh, his consulting engagements include leading the team that investigated the SEC's failure in the uh, Madoff Ponzi scheme. So welcome, Charles. Thank you. Nick Morgan is a partner at Paul Hastings. He's also a prolific writer and thought leader in the area of securities enforcement. Among Nick's recent articles is one that's included in the conference materials called These Are Volatile Times, What Asset Managers Need to Know and Do When SEC Comes Calling. So you can see that in the materials tab uh, on the same player you're looking at right now. It's not at all surprising to me that Mark Cuban turned to Nick last year when he wanted to make a constitutional challenge to the SEC's use of administrative law judges. Welcome, Nick, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Bruce. Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, our SEC representative on the panel wears many hats. It's Kristen Snyder, the Deputy Director and Co-National Associate Director of the Investment Advisor Investment Company Examination Program in the SEC's Office of Compliance, Inspections, and Examinations. But in addition to that, Kristen serves as the Associate, associate Regional Director for Examinations in the San Francisco Regional Office, where she leads the examination program. Uh, she also cut her teeth as an enforcement lawyer, so she's able to look at these issues from both sides of the coin, both regulatory and enforcement. Uh, always love to hear from Kristen. She has a great perspective on these issues. Thank you, Kristen, and welcome. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for having me back. All right, let me turn this over to Lori, and I look forward to the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce, for that introduction, and um, I'm glad to welcome uh, this group of panelists today and be joined by them to talk about how asset managers, broker dealers, and hedge funds are managing through this time. Um, of course, a lot of what we talk about today is going to be uh, directed and guided by the impacts of um, COVID-19 that we've all been um, working through and dealing with. Um, and our brief agenda at the outset, we're going to talk about um, how the OC exam program is managing and some of their uh, priorities in this time of remote work. Then we'll talk about um, a topic particularly relevant in our volatile market, um, which is valuation and valuation issues, new rule proposed by the SEC. And we'll also talk about some recent enforcement activity in that space. And then we'll go through a little bit of a um, topical enforcement grab bag of issues that have been facing um, asset managers and broker dealers and advisors 
in the last few months and that we expect to see continuing. Um, and finally, we'll end with a speed round for our panelists on what they think. Um, we'll try to see if anyone can predict what may come next in 2020, though it's hard given what has already been transpiring and what we're living through um, all together. Uh, separately as we're in our different homes. So let's start with Kristen uh, with an update on how um, OC is managing remote examinations and contacts with regulated entities uh, during, during the pandemic. And of course, the SEC has reiterated and including today comments about how exams and enforcement will continue in this time. Um, we've heard a lot about that, especially on the enforcement side today already. And so let's talk about what the SEC is doing to fulfill its exam obligations and how that's working for examiners. Great. Thanks, Lori. And I'll, um, I'll start with my standard SEC disclaimer, which I think the audience could probably say along with me at this point, because I know you've heard it a number of times today. But the remarks that I make on the panel today are my own, and they don't necessarily reflect the viewpoints held by our commissioners, by our, my colleagues on the commission staff or the SEC. So with that out of the way, I know that um, COVID-19 understandably has been uh, on the agenda for a good chunk of the day today. And we heard um, on the first panel how enforcement is kind of handling the logistics uh, given the kind of new environment that we're all working in. We're kind of uniquely positioned in OC because we're often going out in the field and conducting examinations physically on site at a registrant. So we've definitely had to kind of retool and with all of our examiners working remotely, many firms working remotely, all of our exams at this point are being done by correspondence. And our, our team has familiarity with doing that, but we, we often are conducting our examinations on site. So it has been a bit of a shift. Um, I'm proud to say, I think our team, you know, in health and safety have been kind of at the forefront in the decisions that we've made. And, and we're obviously following all of the um, local, state, you know, federal guidelines around health and safety. But um, our team, I think, working within those guidelines have really done a remarkable job over the last two months in kind of shifting focus and, and working remotely and really still staying focused and productive in our examinations. Um, we put out a statement, or OC did, our director, Pete Driscoll, on March 23rd, just talking about sort of this new normal that we're in. And it, uh, uh, we reiterated in the statement that we are trying to give as much flexibility as possible where it's appropriate to registrants so that if we are on site conducting an examination, we are being flexible with uh, timelines for production of records or for interviews. Um, and I think, you know, we are, uh, we, saw, we definitely saw uh, folks needing some of that uh, relief at the beginning of, of all of this. I think firms are really, I'm pleased to say, I think we're, we're hearing positives from the industry about how, how firms are moving into the new remote environment. And what we did at the beginning as well, um, and it still continues as we've conducted pretty significant outreach. We've done hundreds of outreach calls, both formally and informally, formally as part of exams, as well as informally, just to check in and see how firms business continuity plans are working, um, any particular regulatory or just operational pain points firms are experiencing. And we've been able to take in that feedback and many of these calls we conducted with our colleagues in the Division of Investment Management. And there have been a number of uh, relief measures that have been rolled out to the industry, including in March, uh, the ability for firms to delay the filing of their Form ADV if they were experiencing difficulties um, getting the necessary information together to do that. And one, one thing re we reiterated in the March 23rd statement was to the extent that firms need to take um, advantage of that relief, we encourage it. And it's not something that OC is, is taking into consideration in terms of who to examine next. Um, so we, we wanted to put firms at ease that, that they should really take advantage of that relief where it's appropriate and where it's needed. And I think others um, have referenced, other SEC colleagues today have referenced it, but there is a COVID-19 webpage on the sec.gov site, and it really collects all of the various statements and information that have come out from the commission um, during this very unusual time. So I would encourage you to take a look at that page if you haven't uh, already. And just in follow up on that point, um, one question that has come up in terms of kind of how firms operate through this unusual time is, you know, their need for cash and their need to kind of obtain pay paycheck protection program funds. Um, are there disclosure obligations that firms need to consider if they do need to avail themselves of the um, PPP fund program? 
It's a great question. And we have started to see um, advisors and others putting out statements and disclosures if they are accessing those funds. Um, but I'll direct you to back to that COVID-19 page. Our Division of Investment Management has put out a series of frequently asked questions. And one of them literally is if I, you know, if I avail myself of the, the PPP, what regulatory reporting obligations do I have? And so I think the, um, I won't read you the whole answer, but, but the gist of the answer is, you know, as a fiduciary, you have the obligation to disclose any material information um, that might impact the advisory relationship with your clients. And so to the extent that the, the business is impaired, the firm's business is impaired, and it might prevent the advisor from meeting its contractual obligations to clients, that would certainly need to be disclosed. And if the firm is experiencing any kind of financial difficulties, they may need to make some ADB disclosure around it. Lori, if I could just chime in on that. that, that uh, we've gotten several calls from clients on this specific issue. We've received PPP funds. What's our disclosure obligation? We read the guidance. It's very helpful, but to an issue that comes up over and over again on disclosure, which is materiality, as Kristen just said. So it's um, the situations for recipients of the PPP funds can vary widely. And the question of whether the receipt of those funds is material can differ widely. So it's a it's a nuanced process, and some clients have easy questions to answer, and others have more difficult ones to answer. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, like everything at this time, it's just going to require a little bit of um, everyone trying to work it out as they go forward in real time, looking at the impacts to of the of the virus and related you know, cost expenditures to the fund and then assessing how material or how important these funds are that they're borrowing and trying to make a common sense gauge on disclosure and then looking at um, the commission to appreciate how difficult it is to figure out what the right answer is in this time and, that, and hoping for, you know, some good faith um, on both sides as everyone looks at the disclosure decision. Right. Um, so I think, you know, kind of on the flip side of needing cash to make, you know, operations run at a fund, the flip side is the fund's investments themselves and how they're representing those investments um, to, to their investors and to their clients and customers. And so this is an area of focus as well when the market is all over the place even for you know, liquid assets and equity stocks, but certainly also for other types of assets, making an area of focus for these financial firms' valuation. Um, Charles, can you speak to what you're hearing and seeing from firms about the valuation challenges that folks are facing and how the firms are approaching those issues? Sure. Uh, there are lots of valuation issues that have been coming up. Uh, key among them, I think, is the volatility in the market. And uh, if you looked at the, uh, say, the CBOE volatility index, it peaked in uh, late March at around 66. It usually trades from 10 to 20. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude of volatility that's in the market. So what does that do in terms of valuations? Well, if you've got uh, level one assets where you're basically looking at a market price for a security and then uh, tying it directly to the security that's in your fund or in your holdings. Uh, that's that uh, as well as level two assets, which are kind of a one step away. That's just making a small adjustment to the level one price and then uh, coming in with a value based off of a, of a uh, traded security. Both of those are impacted by volatility because the um, the uh, what happens is the uh, market makers adjust their bid ask spreads and they start to grow and grow and grow and then uh, as those as those bid ask spreads grow then you introduce a new element that the account accountants will look at uh, as well as uh, other valuation professionals and that's the concept of whether or not you're actually dealing with an active market and if you don't have an active market you've got to make some uh, other adjustments. Fortunately, there is good guidance on this because we've been here before. We've been down this road before after the financial crisis. So you can actually go back to some of the post-financial crisis accounting literature, and it speaks directly to this. 
And so I would uh, certainly invite anyone who wants to to dive into that, to, to bring up some of the old literature and, and read through it. I, I did it a few days ago. It was very enlightening. Um, but the uh, I, th I think that will give you some guidance on level one, level two assets. And in just a few minutes, um, Nick is going to talk to you about a, a case where uh, you, know, you have a misapplication or potential misapplication of level one, level two assets. As for level three assets, these are the assets where you have uh, no particular uh, direct observable input. So there's no stock price you can go and look at and pick that out and, and say, yeah, that's my value. You have to build a model or you have to look at market comparables and, and come up with some other calculation. I see that with the volatility in the market and with the, uh, the fact that at the beginning of this year, really just in the last couple of months, something like 80 to 90 percent of all publicly traded firms that gave guidance on their earnings for 2020 withdrew that guidance. So now what you have is a whole bunch of people flying blind. Uh, they, uh, you, you, that means the stock prices, and perhaps that's the cause of the, of the um, uh, volatility, but the stock prices are bouncing around quite a bit. As a result, you may have difficulty getting good market comparables for a level three input asset. And, and that means we're going to probably see more shifts over to the discounted cash flow modeling, which is basically a model that sets out a projection for cash flows year after year after year. And then you can build into that model your uh, assumptions as to what impact the pandemic and the closure from the pandemic will have perhaps in the early years. And then perhaps in some of the later years, you can forecast how we would, how that particular investment would move out of the pandemic. And just keep in mind, though, that uh, in these situations, uh, with using discounted cash flow, there are lots of assumptions. You've got assumptions on interest rates, volatility of the markets, the uh, of course, the cash flows. And so for uh, Securities Council, I think the best thing to do is just go in and ask your clients to explain all the assumptions and walk through it with them. They should be able to explain it to you and hopefully in uh, a, a, a clear and succinct fashion, because that is what's going to be required if um, those valuations are ever challenged. Then I think the next thing, next question you ought to ask them is, where is this documented? Uh, because Kristen's going to talk in a few minutes about uh, a proposed rule that deals with that. that we're going to be, I think, having to, uh, you're going to have to obviously defend those values with your auditors. So there's quite a lot there. Uh, so I see a shift from market approach to the dis discounted cash flow models. That will necessitate a uh, lot more assumptions and a lot more documentation, a lot more research into what those assumptions are. And then at the end of the day, you may actually not see your values for level three assets decline all that much because discounted cash flow puts a lot of emphasis on the final year called the terminal year. Uh, so if the terminal values of a certain investment, a forecast that for that investment are, have not significantly changed because we're talking five, 10 years down the road, uh, then that asset value will probably not change all that much. Uh, so if that, I know that's counterintuitive. That's another reason for securities council to go in and ask more questions and get get the uh, get your client to explain this to you, so that you can make sure. And then of course ask where where is this document. So those are the I think the important takeaways uh, from uh, what's going to happen in terms of valuation. And then, as you kind of indicated, um, Nick was also going to talk about a little bit of the flip side of like what happens when valuation goes wrong or when there are mistakes that are made and um, potentially there isn't this a reasonable basis underlying the assumptions or not all of the assumptions have been fully thought through. Um, and so, Nick, um, do you want to talk about the recent Semper Capital management matter that the commission filed, which involves obviously pre long ago, uh, kind of pre COVID activity um, does deal with valuation issues. Yeah, I do. Uh, actually, when I first when we were starting to prepare for the panel, I realized that uh, the last time Charles and I worked together, it involved the matter after the financial crisis that had some uh, 
valuation issues embedded in it. So it does feel a little bit like deja vu. And um, I think we can probably, like Charles said, draw some lessons from what came out of the financial crisis. Um, one thing, so the case we've all been referring to is this Semper Capital Management, which uh, the commission very thoughtfully brought right before this panel, so we would have something to talk about. Um, and uh, the first thing I noticed was that the conduct goes back to 2013 and 2014. So uh, the first thing that came to mind is these investigations take a long time. So with the market volatility that's going on now, the valuation issues that are presenting themselves now to investment advisors and others, We'll see enforcement actions in 2025, 2026, 2027 about things that are going on right now. Um, and one of the uh, um, side sort of aspects of these cases and the complexity of these cases is that the enforcement division rarely brings a pure valuation case saying, you said the value was X, we say the value was Y. We see that in the Semper Capital Management case, which is briefly the facts. Um, is an open-end fund. Uh, they were charged with overvaluation of odd lot bond positions. Uh, apparently, they were uh, using a third-party pricing service that valued the odd lot bond positions the same at the same level as they valued uh, round lot institutional uh, positions. I'm no expert in uh, odd lot bond valuations. For that, I'd go to Charles. But that does sound a little off to me that you'd get the same valuation for those two different instruments. Uh, and so the SEC uh, brought, brought their action. Um, but some of the thing, there is an aspect of the case that criticizes the valuation itself. I and mean, the, the commission does come out and say, we think this was the wrong valuation. But as is common in these cases, uh, they went on to criticize a couple of other things. The, dele the fund uh, board's delegation of valuation uh, role uh, the difference between the valuation methodology as described internally in documentation for the fund versus what was actually done in terms of how these instruments were valued. And that's something uh, we definitely saw in cases coming out of the financial crisis, uh, attacks on the methodology. Um, another I think, takeaway from both this case and from what we saw in the valuation cases coming out of the financial crisis um, and it's relevant, I think, right now, is that these cases are always brought, as enforcement cases are, with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and so, for particularly for valuation cases where there is a lot of judgment involved, um, it's very normal, and in fact, I would say healthy, to have a robust internal discussion around what the proper valuation should be. Those are discussions with your internal risk management folks, with outside auditors, maybe valuation consultants. There will be dissenting voices who say, no, I think the valuation should be this or that. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that those dissenting voices will be uh, transformed in the later enforcement action into people waving red flags. Uh, and so I think it's important for uh, people who are making decisions right now to understand that the conversations they're having, the documentation that Charles talked about around valuation issues will be scrutinized after the fact with a forensic microscope. And we saw that after the financial crisis, uh, we'll see it now. That's not to say that decision-making needs to be modified, but the documentation of what's occurring now is extremely important. Um, and so I think, well, you know, that, that's evident from the Semper case, uh, and I think it'll be evident in the cases we see coming out of the current volatility around valuation whenever they may be brought. And Nick, I think the only addition that I would add to that is that uh, I noticed in this case and several others that uh, the uh, manipulation, if there is manipulation that goes on in valuations, it's typically done with smaller funds so that that manipulation has more impact. Uh, so that's a uh, that's one uh, uh, additional area to kind of keep in mind. Pay attention if you have a smaller fund. Uh, there was one case that involved PIMCO, it was a few years earlier, and you know, they were trying to launch a new fund. And so that new fund got a bump through the valuation process, and then they were able to market using that. So those are uh, uh, that's perhaps another uh, indicator uh, to look at uh, the smaller funds to see if indeed these transactions that are, are having material impact. Point. Yeah, that is Agreed. a good point. 
Uh, one thing that's interesting, too, is in this time period, in addition to the market volatility, there's also now some regulatory kind of volatility or change. And so on, um, I think in April, the commission issued a new proposed rule to modernize the valuation framework. It had been decades since rulemaking has been done on this in this space. And now kind of coming out in this time period, especially in light of all of the challenges um, that I think market participants face with valuation. It's just, it's very interesting timing. And Kristen, what is the thinking um, behind the new rule and how is it proposing to kind of change the current status quo on valuation if it is adopted? So I think valuation is something, it's been a, it's a perennial risk area for us in the exam program. And just picking up on some of the threads that, that Nick and Charles were talking about, um, I can't stress enough how important it is, and I'll, I promise I'll talk about the rule in just a second, but I think, you know, as examiners, when we're coming in and we're looking at the assumptions that were made and we're asking questions about valuation, I, I can't stress enough how, how important it is to have good documentation around the process. And if modifications were made to the process, you know, definitely need to document those as well. And sometimes we're coming in maybe a year or two after something's been done, there's been turnover in personnel and people are having to reconstruct kind of on the fly while we're there. And that's not a situation I think that you want to be in as a registrant. I think it's so important to document what you're doing. Um, but then the rule proposal, I think the you know valuation guidance, rulemaking, it's been on the table for, for quite some time. And as Lori noted, on April 21st, the commission voted to adopt a new rule proposal that would establish a framework for valuation uh, for, for funds. And so just stepping back, you know, under the Investment Company Act of 1940, securities and assets that don't have readily available market quotations are required to be fair valued. And those fair value determinations need to be made in good faith um, and determined in good faith by funds board of directors. So it's been 50 years uh, since we've tackled valuation and you know, the markets have changed um, and we've, you know, just the, the things have evolved in the last 50 years. And so the, the new rule proposal um, really helps to reflect these market developments. And it's the result of taking in tremendous feedback over the years. And particularly in the last couple of years, I know the Division of Investment Management has really sought industry feedback. And I think this proposed new rule is sort of a culmination of all of that feedback. And I'll highlight a few of the points um, there's a lot of material, as there always is, with a proposed new rule that you can certainly uh, read at your leisure um, on the SEC.gov site. And in fact, um, the, the new proposal will be published in the Federal Register. It's available on the Commission's website, and the comment period will extend through July 21st of 2020. So there's an opportunity for you to comment as well. But under the proposed new rule, um, which it would be new rule 2A5 under the Investment Company Act, it provides um, a determination or requirements for determination of fair value of the fund's investment in good faith. And it would permit the boards, the fund boards to assign that determination of fair value to an advisor of the fund subject to board oversight, as well as imposing a number of other conditions. It helps to define readily available market quotations. And I think this is particularly important because that's really the threshold for when the board's responsibility kicks in to determine fair value in good faith. And then it also recognizes that, you know, the, the advisor, it allows the boards to sort of delegate that fair value uh, determination to the advisor, again, with oversight from the board. And it reflects, you know, kind of the current state where advisors may have, you know, more information to help with that, that fair value determination. But it, it's, you know, importantly puts the board in a position where it can serve um, to assess whether there are particular conflicts of interest just because there are inherent conflicts with the advisor valuing the assets. And that I think is also particularly important. You know, years ago, there was a case called Morgan Keegan where there were, um, there, there wasn't such a framework in place. And so there were sort of inherent conflicts in the way that um, the advisor was valuing fund assets. So the new rule sort of, um, you know, has proposals or, or the proposal would address some of the issues that we've seen in the past and help to, I think, modernize and bring forward um, what is reflective, I think, of the current market. And briefly, before we move on to kind of enforcement um, priorities in this space, Charles, are there is there feedback from the private sector on the proposed rule? Well, uh, th there are some things the private sector ought to take a look at. I think uh, this this is just out, so it's a little tough to tell who's, who's commented yet. But um, 
I, I would say uh, I would advise folks to uh, t- pick this thing up and take a look at it, uh, even if you don't, don't have a lot of funds as your clients, because uh, the, the uh, comments made in the footnotes are uh, tremendously meaningful in terms of valuation issues. And I'll give you one example. Um, and this touches right on the point about documentation. It's uh, There's uh, one footnote in there talking about how it, it's not adequate, not sufficient to simply say you use discounted cash flow for your valuation process. No, you've got to go further. You've got to say uh, provide what they say is additional detail on specific qualitative and quantitative factors to be considered. So if you are making certain assumptions about, say, how the pandemic response will play out in terms of impacting a certain investment, that has to be in there. And uh, other, other elements need to be in there in terms of the uh, assumptions that you've made. So please uh, pay attention to that. Uh, read through the footnotes. These are likely going to be questions that come at your clients if, uh, if the uh, enforcement folks pay a visit. Uh, so d- definitely uh, t- uh, look at look through those. One thing also to keep in mind, just in general, this this rule does talk about uh, the role of internal control, and or it mentions that particularly in the context of Sarbanes Oxley and 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 the requirements imposed on funds by that. Uh, keep in mind that auditors probably have come through and asked these very same questions. So if you have a, a client that is uh, under scrutiny. <coughs> for certain valuations, always ask for the audit work papers related to that particular time period from the auditor. Uh, The auditors of funds pay a lot of attention to valuations. Valuations get uh, uh, tested a couple of different ways. One is to look at specific values that are on the balance sheet, that's logical. But the other that you probably don't know about deals with the testing done of the of the fund or the investment advisor's internal control over valuation, which under COSO standards will say that or set up or set up in such a way that they provide what is called reasonable assurance that the controls will function as planned. So that testing is done by the auditors, and they are making those assessments and documenting those assessments. So you, uh, if you get the audit work papers, it, you may find that the auditors looked at this issue, did some testing, assessed internal control, and you can use that to uh, help guide you in, in terms of the next steps that you take. Thank you for that, Charles. And I think one thing that came in while we were um, talking about valuation that's sort of tangentially related to this is a question about, you know, in the current market, there are often, there are going to be winners and losers. Is there a risk that investment advisors will engage in cherry picking by moving winners into some funds over others, uh, perhaps those with performance fees? And what are the risks and how should, um, folks try to protect against that kind of behavior or advise against it make it give advice that would protect against that sort of behavior anyone want to take that on I, I guess I can throw in one one thought is that uh, under the uh, uh, global investment performance standards promulgated by the uh, CFA Institute uh, there are requirements that uh, if, if you claim that your GIPS compliant then uh, you can have uh, auditors come in and check your allocations process because that's what you're talking about with this question. Yes. And so they can't, they, and they will, they will do that because they're, they're trying to get or to make sure that the per, uh, percentage rate of return that you report is appropriate. And if you've been sending, or, you know, cherry picking, sending your losers over to one place and winners mm-hmm. over to another, then that's, that's something that gets, picked up in the GIPS verification process. So strongly encourage you, uh, you, your your clients ought to be, your your investor clients ought to be asking for GIPS compliance. Great, good advice. Um, Especially as, you know, I do think we all can see that it's going to be difficult for anyone, any advisor to predict exactly how things are gonna go um, in the next few months. 
And so I think at this point, we'll move into some of the substantive areas of enforcement that we had seen as priorities coming into this time and that we expect, you know, we'll talk about whether we expect them to continue um, going forward that are unique to regulated uh, financial firms. I mean, for example, one, there are a couple of priorities such as insider trading and digital assets and the work around those that are covered by other panels today. Um, we may talk about those time permitting, but unlikely we'll be able to cover those types of topics. So I just highlight them at the outset as priorities for financial firms as well to focus on from a compliance perspective, but probably not what we can be, um, what we can cover today. We'll instead start with some topics that are more unique to this group, such as conflicts of interest, uh, fiduciary duty matters, and um, fees and share class disclosure types of, type of issues. And um, this is really going to be for both Kristen and Nick. Uh, does, do these areas continue to be an, a focus of concern for the staff? And do we see that that will continue this, um, in the next few months? Absolutely. Go ahead, Kristen. Oh, yeah. So I can start. And then I know, Nick, you have a perspective as well. But absolutely. And I think our we publish our priorities in the exam program each and every year. And so conflicts of interest and fraud and sales practice issues on the broker dealer side of um, our program, they're always sort of perennial risk areas for us. And so I think undisclosed conflicts or inadequately disclosed conflicts, particularly where there's investor harm, and, and it, we, we tend to write our prior, we tend to write our prior, priorities fairly broadly because they come in all different flavors. And um, But yes, absolutely, it's a, it's a key focus for us. And it'll, it's something because it's uh, so impactful often to retail investors when you're talking about share class selection issues, which I know were highlighted last year and with the share class selection disclosure initiative have been highlighted over and over again with the number of cases brought. But really, you know, we, we continue to see issues where there are undisclosed conflicts. There may be revenue sharing of, of different stripes, um, you know, involving maybe an affiliated broker with an advisor and the advisor doesn't then disclose that conflict and the basis or the incentive that they may have to recommend a particular investment to their clients. So it's something that we keenly focus on. Um, so I think it's always important to make sure you have a clear understanding of where the conflicts may lie in your business. So as a fiduciary, you can make sure that those are adequately disclosed because that is an area I think um, where it you know, is, is likely if we're seeing it in a, any significant way or recidivist way, even in the exam program, that it's likely to get you referred to enforcement. And I, maybe I'll just add the defense perspective, which uh, the the most of the frustration, I think, uh, from the advisor side comes when there is a disagreement around adequacy of disclosure. So, uh, you know, conflicts of interest covers a lot of different types of enforcement uh, activities. Uh, and in a lot of these places, uh, advisors feel they have adequately disclosed uh, potential conflicts. Conflicts are uh, almost inherent in the relationships uh, between investment advisors and clients, or at least they come up a lot. Um, take, for example, the trade allocation cases you referred to and Charles discussed. Um, there may be very good and proper and perfectly innocuous reasons to do post-trade allocations, good business reasons to do it. And uh, when there is a disagreement about whether that's been adequately disclosed, I think that's where you see sort of the frustration from the investment advisor community. And um, Kristen mentioned the uh, share class initiative around 12B1 uh, fee disclosure. And I think that's a, that's a very good example of uh, frustration around a disagreement on whether uh, disclosure has been adequate. Uh, one of the frustrations with that initiative um, is that those uh, firms that are disclosing the fact that their uh, investors, their clients are being put in uh, share classes in which there is a fee that goes to, to the benefit of the advisor. Um, they are being lumped together in that uh, initiative with people whose disclosures may have been outright false uh, or may have been woefully inadequate. Um, and yet, if you self-report, you sort of get treated and viewed by the rest of the world as having uh, similar conduct, uh, for, you know, despite the fact that it's very uh broad range of conduct that was swept up into that initiative. Um, another frustration that, that showed up in the, uh, uh, the initiative, but is a broader issue, 
is uh, if there is a practice that is very widespread, like disclosures around uh, share class fees, um, one way for the SEC to deal with that is to use the enforcement division. And you can do that efficiently with a good use of resources by having an initiative and to get people to self-report. Um, another way to deal with that is to promulgate a rule that makes it clear what the conduct is. So clearly there were a lot of disclosures that did not go as far as what the SEC wanted, and the decision was made to use the initiative process and self-reporting to correct that. Um, for those advisors who felt their disclosures were uh, good uh, but did not meet the SEC standard, I think they would very much have preferred to get guidance to the entire industry in, form of, in the form of rulemaking uh, or otherwise rather than be subjected to and basically threatened with uh, an enforcement action if they fail to self-report for something that, as we can see from the results, was a very widespread activity and covered, as I said, a lot of different kinds of disclosure. So, uh, yes, we'll absolutely see a continuation of conflicts of interest. As Kristen said, that is a perennial part of the program, um, and there's uh, nothing suggesting those cases are going to go away. But those are some of the frustrations from the on the uh, defense side of things. And do we anticipate that the um, share class initiative work will kind of be dwindling going forward and will there be something that replaces it um, that we kind of anticipate may become future focus um, in this space? And this can go either to Charles or Nick, if either of you have thoughts on that. Charles? Okay, yeah, I, I would say, uh, yeah, my, my uh, uh, interest or my, my uh, uh, attention has been drawn to uh, these cases uh, brought by enforcement against uh, private equity funds. Uh, that is a, a whole nother ball of wax. It's opening up uh, some of the issues Nick discussed earlier about valuation cases and uh, that it was, uh, it was unusual to see these valuation cases. Now they're being brought against uh, funds uh, and uh, that, that are not publicly traded, but uh, hold investments in uh, public or uh, entities that are going public. And so that, that was one uh, new trend that uh, I think will continue. So, we're coming up, I think, to the close to the end of our time. And so before we um, run out of time, I wanted to briefly touch on or give Kristen the opportunity to briefly touch on regulation BI and form CRS compliance, because I think it's coming. The date is coming. The chairman has said we're holding to the date. We're sticking with it. Um, and um, I know that firms have been doing a lot of work in that space already, anticipating that it is um, that it is going to come to fruition. But Kristen, confirm for us that this is still happening, still an area of focus, and how the SEC will evaluate compliance by firms in light of kind of the changing world we're in, created by nineteen. Sure. No, I'm happy to. And as you noted, Laura, so the regulation best interest and form CRS could probably take up an entire panel. Um, but there, there are True. a significant number of resources on our form CRS and regulation best interest page um, on the SEC.gov website. And our chairman did come out um, on April 2nd and confirmed that we are sticking to the June 30th compliance date for regulation best interest and form CRS. Um, there are a significant number of resources that I think have been put out for firms as they prepare, and we are hearing that, you know, firms have, have been preparing. That said, I think the chairman's statement did encourage firms to the extent that they are impacted by COVID-19 and on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis to approach uh, the commission for relief if they don't feel like they can meet those deadlines. But there's been, I think, you know, significant industry preparation um, since the adoption of the, the rule um, or the regulation. Uh, and we've put out a lot of resources, I think, as a commission to try to help firms prepare. And so from OC's perspective, in April, we also issued two risk alerts, one on form CRS and one on regulation best interest, just to highlight what we are likely to look for as we come in and conduct examinations. And I think as the uh, compliance date passes, our, some of our first set of examinations are simply going to be to come in and confirm that firms have thought about this, that there are policies and procedures that they've put into place that they're tailored for the firm's particular business as we would expect with you know kind of any policies and procedures 
And on the regulation best interest front, um, that firms have really, uh, I know we just talked about conflicts of interest, but they've, that broker dealers have really sat down and thought about the conflicts that they have and put uh, controls in place to sort of mitigate those. So I'd encourage you, I see Bruce popping up on the screen, but I would encourage you to, um, to you know, review the risk alerts that we put out because they do have a pretty significant amount of information in terms of what we'll be asking for as an exam program. Yes, and I do see Bruce popping up, so I don't think, I don't know if we have time for the speed round. I, I think we are out of time, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry everyone. You'll have to stick with the one big thing videos, which is a version of that. And I know that some on the panel submitted them, so commend those to your viewing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. That was a great deep dive on regulated entities and financial firms. Our next and final panel is a really good one. It's on whistleblowers that you won't want to miss. It starts at 4.40 p.m. Pacific. Uh, thank you again to this panel. I really enjoyed that. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you.